Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. For God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great and greatly to be praised. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. For God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great and greatly to be praised. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. The zeal of God has consumed me. It burns within my soul. A driving force that cannot be stopped. A fire that cannot be quenched. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Oh Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. The zeal of God has consumed me; it burns within my soul. A driving force that cannot be stopped, a fire that cannot be quenched. Oh Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, oh Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. The zeal of God has consumed me; it burns within my soul. A driving force that cannot be stopped, a fire that cannot be quenched. Oh Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, oh Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. We trust in you. Thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. in the sight of the Lord.
great thing about that song is it always humbles us because we always seem to miss the timing. I don't know why. Now, this next song, we just want to encourage you that we have been drawn near and brought near by the blood of Jesus. And this morning, if you don't feel worthy to come near to God, then join the club. None of us are worthy, but through the washing of his blood, we can come in this morning. He's bidding us come. And thank God he's not bidding us to come through our own righteousness, but through the blood of Jesus that's been shed for us. So I, so I want to encourage you, come in on the boldness of that shed blood, not upon the boldness of what you've done, but the boldness of what he's done for you. And he will receive you this morning. So let those barriers be broken between you and him by his precious blood. Let's enter in. Take me past the outer courts Into the holy place Past the brazen altar Lord, I want to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people And the priests who sing your praise Lord, I hunger and thirst for your righteousness that is only found one place take me into the holy of holies take me in by the blood of the lamb take me into the Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take me past the outer courts, into the holy place, past the brazen altar. Lord, I want to see your face, pass me by the crowds of people. And the priests who sing your praise Lord, I hunger and thirst for your righteousness That is only found one place Take me into the holy of holies Take me in by the blood of the Lamb Take me into the holy of holies. Take the coal, cleanse my lips. Here I am. One more time. Take me past the outer courts into the holy place, past the brazen altar. Lord, I want to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people And the priests who sing your praise Lord, I hunger and thirst for your righteousness That is only found one place Take me into the holy of holies Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me in to the Holy of Holies. Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. Hallelujah. Let's make this final song our prayer to God this morning. Open your hearts to Him. He will give that which we need. Let's make this our prayer request.
guys, if, uh, if you have your Bibles, um, open it with me, first of all, to Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35. This morning, I titled this message, it's a difficult subject, but I titled this message, The Doctrine of Hell, MIA, Missing in Action. Um, it's a teaching of Scripture that hell is a real place. Um, hell is indeed an eternal place. And yet, it's not really spoken of a lot today in our churches and from our pulpits. And it's obviously not a topic we enjoy to talk about. However, I've often wondered the amount of people who go to church all the time never hear about the doctrine of hell end up dying unsaved and go to this place called hell and wonder why their preacher didn't tell them about it or warn them about it prior. Because I think we live in a day now that there are even so-called Bible-believing churches that would even deny the existence of hell as a real place. In fact, more and more in our land, um, there are professing Christians who... Uh, we would look up to in many regards who say, well, we don't believe in hell. We don't believe that hell's a real place. And we believe that when you die, you die. And that's the end of it. And of course, there is an aspect of our human, human nature that we wish that was the case. However, hell is real. Hell is eternal. And if hell wasn't real, and if hell wasn't eternal then salvation wouldn't be quite as urgent as it really is. If there was no consequences for my actions of rejecting Christ and living a sinful life, of never receiving Christ in my life, if there were no eternal consequences connected with that issue, then the urgency of repentance would be taken out of our message. So, I'm here just to simply proclaim to you what the Bible says, and the Bible does declare that, that, that hell is real, and hell should be avoided with every fiber of our being. 
and the gospel is the only way that you and I can avoid it. I'm not here to manipulate you. I'm not here to emotionally use this teaching to manipulate you in any way this morning, because I know this, that only the Holy Spirit can drive home the reality of these things to your heart and to your soul. So uh, I'm not going to be screaming at you, manipulating you emotionally. That's not my intent this morning. But my intent is to tell you the truth of Scripture and to warn you to flee from the wrath to come and to flee from this place because it is real. And I want you to know that after this morning, you won't be able to go away and say, that preacher never told me about this place. I wish he did. Um, now, I've also, um, I'm going to be quoting Jonathan Edwards extensively in this message. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the classic sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? How, how many of you did that in English literature class? Probably not here, I imagine. Um, it's, a, it's a powerful uh, scripture. It's a powerful sermon. And of course, Jonathan Edwards was branded as being a hellfire preacher because he, uh, he's known chiefly for that one sermon. But he preached a lot more on the love of God than he did on hell. I, you know, I, I, I need to tell you that. Um, to use an analogy, and analogies, I'm not trying to make light of the doctrine of hell when I use this analogy, but to use this analogy, I liken the doctrine of hell as cayenne pepper. Uh, uh, does anyone cook here with cayenne pepper? Uh, we need the right blend, don't we? Uh, okay. <laughs> really? Okay. Oh, too much. Okay. How many of you have tried to eat cayenne pepper by itself? Ben? You are an oddity, Ben. In other words, if all I ever preached to you was the doctrine of hell, it would be the equivalent of eating nothing but cayenne pepper. However, correctly blended into the rest of the doctrines of the faith, it becomes a beautiful thing. And the doctrine of hell, even the doctrine of hell becomes a beautiful doctrine when it's studied and meditated in the light of the gospel message. Because then we are thankful for what God has delivered us from. And we are thankful that even though I can tell you now, I deserve hell. I know I do. Yet God has rescued me from hell. And if he did nothing more than rescue me from hell, then that would be enough to give thanks to God for all eternity. Because I know that's what I deserve. And I know that if it depended on me to escape hell, it would have never have happened. Only by the grace of God can we escape this place. And only by God's gifted righteousness given to us can we escape. Life is so fleeting. Life is so temporary in nature. How, how many of you know, none of us know the day of our death. None of us know our last day on earth. I was reading about a man just recently. And I believe he was a man that, that was used by God. But he was planning his whole you know, teaching for the next coming year. He was a preacher. And he's passed away now. He's gone. None of us know when our last day on earth is going to be. Life is so fragile that we could lose our life at any moment. And this is why the doctrine of hell must be preached, that we must settle this matter of where we will spend eternity. Uh, because eternity is forever. This life is temporary by contrast. And Deuteronomy 32 verse 35, it was the text that Jonathan Edwards used with his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I chose the King James Version here because that was all he had back then. Um, he didn't have the ESV. So uh, let's uh, look at this and let's remember that God is righteous. God is a just God. And if we live our whole lives through denying him and denying his rightful place in our life, we will give account to this God. Scripture says that the body returns to the dust 
but the spirit returns to God who gave it. Every human being will have to give account to God. Now he says, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that shall come upon them make haste. I think life is like walking on ice and we don't know it. It's like walking on ice with immeasurable water underneath us and we don't realize that at any time this, this mortal life could break from under us and any one of us could slip into eternity at any given moment. Do we realize how fragile life really is? Now, I know we don't like to think about this, yet isn't it of critical importance that if this life is, a, is as a vapor in contrast to what's to come, aren't we odd as human beings because we spend more time on the vapor than the life to come? We value the vapor more, it would seem, than what's coming. What's coming is forever. Down here below is temporary. Now, Jonathan Edwards says this, and I like what he has to say. I, I agree with what he says. He says, there is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. Think about that for a moment. God would have every right to send a person to hell because that's what we deserve. Now, you may argue with me this morning and argue with that case, but I can tell you this. Every mouth will be stopped before a holy God. No matter how good we think we are, when you stand before a perfect holy God, you would even agree with his sentence if you die unsaved and you die outside of Christ, you will have to agree with his eternal declaration that hell is what we deserve. The amazing thing to us is that God in his common grace prolongs, delays, puts up with us, and keeps us in this life for so long. Even though many of us have used this life to live against him. Many people use the breath that God has given to them, the brain that God has given to them, to try to prove God's non-existence. To speak blasphemy against him. Consider the patience of God here that he continues to allow us to exist. Oh, the very rioters in our nation right now that are going and looting and polluting. God gave them the energy, but they're applying the energy in a misguided way. The very philosophies that stir that up, God gave them that very brain. And yet still God, by his mere pleasure, allows people to continue, allows people to live. And even that, if we see ourselves in the true light, we don't even deserve that. But God is very patient with us. If God wanted to, he could take away my breath right now. He could end my life right now. And there is nothing I could do about it. He could say, Brian, you're done. What? But God, I got all these plans. No, you're done. I'm done. But let me preach one more sermon. No, you're done. Let me get this right first. No, you're done. And there will come a moment in our life when God says, we're done, we're done. And we can beg and plead with him to, God, give me a second chance. No, it's it. It's history now. That one shot you had is gone. That's how fleeting life is. Now, one reason why we need to consider eternity is that this is a kind of a paradox. But if we consider eternity, we will live this temporary better than what we are. Because we'll start valuing things more from an eternal perspective instead of a temporary perspective. I'm not going to preach to you your best life now because it isn't unless, unless you're an unsaved person. This is your best life now. This is it. 
But if you're a Christian, this is not your best life now. Your best life is coming. And I know Christians who are suffering right now, who are going through it right now, and they hear that kind of message, and they're like, have I sinned in some way? Because I'm missing this picture here. I see Christians having a great time here, almost like they're living a cruise. And here I am struggling with life. What have I done wrong? No, my friend, it could be that you've done everything right. These people who preach these kind of messages are using the wrong evaluation. We need to evaluate from eternity and be comforted by the reality. This is not our best life now. It's coming for the Christian. But if you're an unbeliever, this is all you've got. But that can change if you give your life to Christ. Now, Jonathan Edwards goes on to say, aren't you glad that preachers don't wear hair like that anymore? That's good news. Um, but oh, that we would preach like they did. We, we'd be blessed then. But he said, by the mere pleasure of God, I mean his sovereign pleasure. God is sovereign over your life. Unbeliever, God is still sovereign over your life. You deny his lordship, but you're still going to bow the knee. You deny, in some cases, his existence, but he is the one who has set the hour of your clock, and he is the one who has determined the days that you will live on earth. And at any moment, even though you deny his sovereignty, he could breach in on your life and say, it's enough, it's done. Then what are you going to do? With all of your denying of God's sovereignty, His sovereignty has just imposed himself upon you. And very often he does it without warning. He does it without warning. We would think as believers he might notify us first. But how many of you know God is not obligated to notify us? I know a few years ago there was a mixed message where Terry, our friend Terry Miller, was sat in the congregation And somebody announced her death. Do you remember that, Terry? Because it got twisted. There was more than one Terry, and there was a Terry that passed away, our brother, actually, in the Lord that passed away in the car accident. And someone said, Terry Miller died, and she sat there in the congregation. And I swear she touched herself just to make sure she was still here. Because you would watch the movie, The Sixth Sense, right? Am I really here? Um... But anyway, but that was, that was a, a Sunday morning we will not forget, Terry. Very, thank God, it's um, good. Giving announcements is a dangerous enterprise, isn't it, Ben? We have to say, those announcements were not a sleeper. They, were, they really had our attention. What, Terry? No, she's here. Thank God. Um, no, for the believer, when we do pass, it's a glorious thing, though it's sad for us here. We miss them terribly. But it's better to go and be with Christ than to remain here, although we often don't view it that way because we're too connected to the current realm of existence. But to deliver this quote again, it says, by the mere pleasure of God, I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation, hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else but God's mere will had in the least degree or in any respect whatsoever any hand in the preservation of wicked men one moment. That's a mouthful, I know. We don't speak that way anymore, do we? However, yeah, Let us speak five words that we can understand and a thousand in an unknown tongue. Um, But what he's saying is, is, is that God is not obligated to prolong our life. He doesn't owe us anything. In fact, the fact that he does prolong our life is a mercy in and of itself because he wants us to repent. He wants us to give our lives to him. He wants us to settle this matter of eternity Uh, The reason why he delays his coming in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, God is long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. Now, Luke 12, let's go back to Scripture here because Scripture is the final authority. Luke 12, verse 13 through 21. Jesus gives a parable of the rich fool. And there was a couple of brothers in the crowd who wanted Jesus to settle a matter of the will. Isn't it sad sometimes that when people do die, the first thing that comes out isn't the grieving for that person, but the covetousness after that person's possession. Well, he's gone now. I'll take his boat. Well, give it, give it a couple of months at least before you start bringing that up, right? But anyway, we'll read this. And the reason why I chose this text is because it clearly shows us that God is the one who gets to decide when people die. Not us. One of the curses of Revelation is that it says people will seek death and not find it. It's not gotten that bad yet, but it will. That things will get so bad with our best life now that people will actually seek death and not be able to find it. That's a curse of the curse. But let's read this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Covetousness is our desire for the things of this current world. Covetousness is what causes us to choose this current world over eternity. We choose this vapor over what's to come. And Jesus said this, For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. It really doesn't. Your life is far more precious than what you possess. Jesus put it this way in another passage, What does it profit the man if he was to gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Your soul is more precious than all the possessions on planet Earth because all the possessions on planet Earth are subject to decay. They're temporary. But your soul is eternal forever. Treasure that above all things. And if you put your soul above temporary things, then your heart and mind will be in the right place. Um, and he told them a parable saying, now some of the parables of Jesus are, th are that, they're stories. Other parables would appear to be about real people that actually lived. And this could be one of those cases where even though it's put in a parable, Jesus being God, it, you know, knows about this person because he is God, and he states a real event of someone that actually lived, and someone that actually lived for this present luxuries, and he died. Now, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. Know this is planning for the future. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. Sounds like an exciting way to live, doesn't it? And there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, he's planning his retirement here, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Oh, yeah, I'll get to enjoy this stuff. Oh, but know this, but God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. But wait, God, I'm not ready yet. No, I got all these plans. No, this night, this very night, no, this, no warning. This night your soul is required of you right now. And the things you have prepared, those, well, whose will they be? God is interacting with this man as he takes him out of this world. And Jesus said, 
so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. God is the one who gets to decide when we die and when we don't die. He's the one. Ultimately, Hebrews 9.27, I'll just give the verse 27, although the verses around it are great too. It says, and as it is appointed. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm late for all kinds of appointments. But this appointment I'm not going to be late for. How do I know? Because God has set that appointed time. And God has set that appointed time in my life when I will live my last day on earth. It is appointed not by me, but by God. It is appointed not by you, but by God. And as it is appointed for men to die once, you're going to die once, but after this, the judgment. It's what comes after that really counts above anything else. We're living now for what's coming. Now, the appointed time, the humbling thing about this is it's in God's book, not mine. He's got that exact date, that exact time, that exact hour, that exact minute, that exact second when I'm going to leave planet Earth. I know some of you here are rooting for the rapture before that event, but either way, we're going to go. And even that is in God's appointed calendar, not ours. He's not told us the day or the hour. So here, the reason why wicked men exist still on planet Earth and the reason why unbelievers still get to live isn't because God lacks the power to take away that person's life. It isn't because God couldn't at any moment say, now's the time to bring judgment. He lets that person live because he's merciful, he's gracious to all, he's good to all, even the wicked, even those who hate him. He's good to them. He gives them life. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. God created you. God gave you the life you have. That is an expression of his love. Now, here, uh, Jonathan Edwards says, there is no want of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. Do we believe that? Well, whether you believe it or not, it's true. <laughs> Men's hands can't be strong when God rises up. The strongest have no power to resist him, nor can any deliver out of his hands. My friends, when it's time, it's time. I've met people, Christians, who are struggling right now with their current existence, who have actually asked me, Brian, pray for me to die. And I just tell them, I say, you know, that hour is in God's keeping. I know you're hurting right now. I know you're suffering right now. And I know you realize that this life, you know, this is not your best life now. It's coming and you can hardly wait for that moment when God does take you home. But we can't rush it. We have to bow the knee to God on this. Um, we can't dictate to God when we're going to die, when we're not going to die. We, a part of our surrender to God and our submission to God is we leave that with him. And my friend, if you're hurting now, and there's a part of you that's saying, I just want to go to be with Jesus. There's a reason why he's not taking you home yet, because he wants to still use you for his glory. You say, how can God use my sickness for his glory? Let me tell you what. God has used believers who are struggling with their sickness, because what that shows others, it shows the realness and the validity of your faith. It also shows the grace of God in keeping you in the midst of all of that, that you're still able to praise him. And I tell you what, if, if, if we all just had our best life now, that wouldn't be real. It would be false. It would be phony because perhaps we would be serving God just because he gives us nothing but good. But we serve him in the midst of tribulation. Jesus said this, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now he goes on to say here, they deserve to be cast into hell. Now, there are human beings who would fight against the doctrine of hell because we believe that we don't deserve hell. Well, here's the problem. If we believe we don't deserve hell, we don't know the true nature of human beings. We don't know the true nature of mankind. We don't realize 
um, something called the doctrine of sin. Um, it's termed by theologians the doctrine of human depravity. And what it means there is not that man is totally depraved from the standpoint of having goodness in him through what God's created in him, but depraved from the standpoint of not wanting to come to God, refusing to come to God, will not come to God apart from God's grace working to draw him. Uh, Jesus put it this way, John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father draws him and I raise him up on the last day. So here, and I would agree with this, they deserve to be cast into hell so that divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God's using his power at any moment to destroy them. Yea, on the contrary, justice calls aloud for an infinite punishment of their sins. My friend, it's not just what we've done, it's, it's, what, it's, it's who we've done those things against. Um, that makes sin worse. Um, Divine justice says of the tree that brings forth such grapes of Sodom, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? The sword of divine justice is every moment brandished over their heads, and tis nothing but the hand of arbitrary mercy and God's mere will that holds it back. Think about that. It's God's mercy that holds it back. Luke 13, 6 through 9. Let's... Let's go there. Why does God allow sinful people to live so long? Some of the worst people on planet Earth have been given a long life. And this is why. I believe Jesus captures the the reason here in this parable of why he delays his justice, he delays his judgment, because you know, it's his wish that all should come to repentance and, and to receive him. He gives that opportunity of the gospel going forth. He, let's read it. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, this is awesome. Because in the parable, what he really has in mind is Israel. Think about that. We could look at it from an individual standpoint, nothing wrong in that. But in context, Jesus, how long did Jesus minister to Israel? Three and a half years, but for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree. And I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on man- manure. You got manure in your life? That's about, you know what manure is. It's not very, doesn't smell very good. We have um, stuff in our yard that we've been putting in a pot and it really stinks. Um, and we got a visit from our bulldog, our resident bulldog the other day. And that was one of the first places he went to to check it out. He could smell it from his place. But we use manure to help things grow. And don't be surprised if the Lord uses manure in your life to help you grow. (laughs) Just saying, the Lord uses manure to help you grow and be fruitful. It's smelly, but it has its purpose. So, um, and... And then he says, then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So notice the, the prolonging, the delay. It's always best to delay. God delays. God is long-suffering. He's patient. He's kind. Give people time. And that's what he does. Now, Romans 9.22 captures it. And this is good news. Because a lot of people, you see... One of their accusations against there being a God is like, if there is a God, then why does he allow all this evil? Surely evil is a proof to me that there is no God. Well, let me tell you this. God will judge all evil in the end. But, and this may shock you, if God was to judge evil now, he'd have to judge you as well. But this tells us why The world is in its current state of affairs because God is letting the gospel go forth and he's prolonging um, 
I love the New King James Version here, Romans 9.22. It says, What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, he is going to do that. But what if prior to that, he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Can God do that? Doesn't he have the right to do that if he chooses to? And that's exactly what our God does. Thank God he does. Because I too was a vessel of wrath at one point in my life. And God had mercy on me and turned me around. Thank God. Now, John 3.36. Let's go there. John 3.36. Whoever. This is good news. Because whoever means who? Whoever. <laughs> Amen. So we preach this to everybody. Whoever believes. Whoever puts their trust relies in the Son, depends in the Son, notice this, has what? Eternal life. That's the most important thing we need to settle in this life now. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. We can't earn this. It's a gift of His grace. If we go to God and say, give me what I deserve, then my friend, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, that people would settle this vital issue. We can argue about all the other stuff later, right? Which we do as Christians, it would seem. But let's settle this matter here. Let's settle the eternal matter. This is the foundation of salvation. We can argue about other things but this is something that all true Bible-believing Christians agree on, that there is an eternity. Where will you spend eternity? The vital aspect of our gospel message is where will you spend eternity? With God forever or under his displeasure and under his wrath forever? Those are the options. But my friend, God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Notice the tense there, that you can have assurance now on this side of glory it, that if you were to die tonight, you would go to heaven. And only Jesus can give you that kind of assurance. You can look at yourself and say, well, I'll try and be good enough. I'll try to clean up my life. That will never work. That will never be enough. You might impress me. You might impress your parents even. But it won't impress God. Because it's only receiving the Son and His gift of righteousness that gives us that assurance that if you were to die tonight, you would go to heaven. Has, present tense, eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You see, the point of our message to you as a church this morning is that the wrath of God was put on Jesus Christ at the cross. God the Father poured out his wrath against your sin on the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what made the cross necessary. And the believer that comes to the cross, that comes to God through the gift of his Son, the wrath is taken from us, placed on his Son, that we now could say, we are no longer appointed under wrath, but to obtain salvation. But my friend, rejecting Christ, the wrath of God remains on you. But it doesn't have to be that way. This is the sad, this is the sorrow and the tragedy and the frustration of us who preach the gospel to others is we don't come at you like we're better than you. We, we, we come at you as people who were once under the wrath of God, deservedly so. But we found refuge at the cross. We found that Jesus died for all our sin and the, all of the wrath of God was poured out on him. So I don't have to fear the wrath of God anymore. One payment, one price, it was a full blood-bought redemption for you and me. But if you reject him, you reject his cross, and you reject his finished work for you, God's wrath remains on you. The wrath of God remains on him. 
The fact that we're even talking about this is a miracle in and of itself. It shows God's grace working in our hearts to present this to you. Now, Jonathan Edwards said this. He says, they are already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. Do you realize that outside of Christ, that sentence is upon us? They don't only justify, or they don't only justly deserve to be cast down thither, but the sentence of the law of God. God's law, how many of you know the Ten Commandments? Do you know the Ten? Maybe you know about eight, seven, eight of them, nine of them. But however much you know, if you only know one of them, it's enough to condemn us because we realize I can't even do one. But God's law um, shows us his perfect righteousness. And when you examine yourself in the light of God's law, you realize I don't measure up. I can't do this. And God's law reveals our sin. It reveals his perfection and our sin. And God's law is what judges us at the end of the day. God's law is just. God's law is holy. God's law is righteous. And if you are unsure what God's law is, go home and read Exodus chapter 20. And it reiterates all those Ten Commandments. And to give you a clue, it deals with, with relationships. It deals with our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And as we examine our relationship with God and then our relationship with others around us, we realize we don't measure up. We don't do what we should. Um, so anyway, they don't only justly deserve to be cast down to them, but the sentence of the law of God, that eternal, how many of you know the law of God is eternal? And it's in me. Why, why is it eternal? Because it's a decree that came from his very nature. That's why. It's a decree for humanity, what was made in his image. And it's not been done away with. It never shall be. It's eternal and immutable, unchangeable. In other words, it's not subject to change. One of the things that's given this nation power over the 200 plus years it's been in existence is that the laws of the land were impacted by the Bible. You know, the Ten Commandments and all of that. Um, the laws of our land, but trying to change these laws is really the heart cry of sinners because we don't like this current establishment and rebellion. You know I joke about it because I'm British, but this nation was founded on rebellion. I'm just saying. Now, sometimes there's a just rebellion, um, but you missed out on some good tea. That's all I'm going to say. But anyway, um, eternal, immutable rule of righteousness that God has fixed between him and mankind is gone out against them and stands against them so that they are bound over already to hell. You see, if we remain outside of Christ, then we will be judged by God's law. And God's law is perfect, and no human being can stand under it. But God sent his son. There is someone who's lived that perfect life. There is someone who died that, that, that perfect death. There is someone who's risen from the dead to represent you before God the Father. There is a way out of this. There is a way through this. And that, my friend, is not in you, but it's in him. Matthew 5.20, let's go there. You, you might still be persuaded, well, I'm still going to try religion to get out of this. I'm going to try and clean my life up. I'm going to do my utmost. I'm going to do everything my denomination tells me to do. And by golly, they said that's enough, that's enough. Well, no, it isn't. It's only Christ that's enough. And the scribes and Pharisees would be the epitome of the strength of religion because these people really did try. They failed, and it turned them into hypocrites. And what made them hypocrites was they were pretending to be clean when they were not clean, and they were pretending that their works were enough. But Jesus gives us this warning here. And this should put an end to all human legalism as an effort to get to heaven. He said, Jesus said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to get in that way. 
You see, for you to get into heaven before a perfect God, that requires a perfect righteousness, a righteousness that you yourself do not possess. But it is a righteousness that's given to you from God the Father himself who desires that perfection, and he gives you the perfect righteousness of his own son. Isn't that awesome? You say, yeah, but I'm not perfect. No, you're not. Neither am I. But that's the foundation of our acceptance with God is an imputed righteousness, a righteousness that wasn't something that I worked, but something that he worked. And then as he grows me in this righteousness, the foundation of that is that imputed righteousness. God the Father views me in his son, Jesus Christ. That righteousness is perfect, though, of course, he's not unmindful of my condition and what still needs to be transformed and changed. But at the end of the day, we are saved by the righteousness of another, not our own. That, my friend, is the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus the Son, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of who? God. In him, Jesus the Son. That's the gospel. Now, all wicked men's pains and contrivance they use to escape hell while they continue to reject Christ and so remain wicked men don't secure them from hell one moment. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. Man, I don't know about you, but when I heard about hell, I realized I can't get out of that. But there are people out there who actually deceive themselves and think, nope, I can escape it. I'm smart enough. I'm good enough to escape this place. He depends on himself for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done. It reminds me of, oh, I forget the man's name now, but he worked for Bezos Funeral. Wonderful man. He's, he's, he has a Scottish background. And he drove me in Green River uh, around the tombstones. And he was saying, you know, there's a tombstone over there of a businessman who says, I got out of a lot of holes, but I'm not going to get out of this one. And uh, I forget his name, but he was an interesting man. When he found out that I spent time in Scotland and in England, oh, he talked about Scotland. And, and I love that man. He's retired now, I think, but real nice, real nice fellow with Scottish background. Um, there's no escaping this. So we've talked ourselves out of a lot of things. There's no talking ourselves out of this one. He depends upon himself for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done, in what he is now doing, or what he intends to do. Everyone lays out matters in his own mind, how he shall avoid damnation, and flatters himself that he contrives well for himself and that his schemes won't fail. Oh, my friend, but they will. What is it that God requires from us? He requires from us repentance. He requires from us coming to himself. He requires giving up our own way, and giving our whole lives to him. Let's read Romans 2, verse 4 and 5 here. This is what he requires. And yet, if as we go on our life rejecting this, we um, despise his goodness to us and his forbearance and his long-suffering. Um, this is God's attributes towards us. And um, yet, he's given us opportunity to repent to turn from our sinful way and to come to him just as we are and coming in all our unworthiness and receiving him even this day? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance and long-suffering? That's God's mindset towards us. Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So according to this passage, what is it that leads you and me to repentance? The goodness of God. God is good. Well, you might say, well, if God is good, then I need not fit. Well, here's the issue. God is good and I'm not. But notice the opposite response. But in accordance with your hardness. Nope, not going to do this. 
and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. My friend, we take no pleasure in this subject, but we would not be fulfilling our responsibility as a church if we never told you about hell and warned you not to go there and told you how to avoid it. Um, because, you know, I believe there are people who have gone there who have been told, oh, there's no such thing as this place. And now they're suffering for all eternity. And that preacher that told them that will stand before God and give account for that false message that they gave to those people. It goes on to say here, and for some reason, it reminds me of ice fishing. How many of you have been ice fishing? I, I don't like ice fishing uh, because you hear it contract. Now, at a certain time of the year, there are people who claim to drive cars on it, and I've seen that happen. But I've also heard of people who have gone underneath the ice, and, and I'm like, though I can't choose the day of my death, I don't want to die that way. And so to ensure I don't die that way, ice fishing is taboo. It's gone. It's gone from my calendar. I don't do it anymore. That's the only way I can be assured I'm not going to die that way. Okay? Some of us, we say, I'm not afraid of dying. It's how I'm going to die that I'm scared of, right? And I don't want to go out through the ice. Not fun. Um, but when he says this, unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering, and that's true. Um, what is it that's keeping us? Um, it, at any moment, you know, um, what's keeping us could be taken away. And there are innumerable places in this covering so weak that they won't bear their weight, and these places are not seen. And that's true. Um, just a couple more things here, guys, and then we'll wrap up here. Um, but it says, God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep any natural man out of hell one moment. As we pointed out, God's not promised this um, outside of his son, that is. Only in his son has he given us promises pertaining to deliver us from such a place. God certainly has made no promises either of eternal life or of any deliverance or preservation from eternal death. But what are contained in the covenant of grace? Did you get that? Covenant of what? Grace? Only by grace. Only by grace can we be delivered from this. Not by law, but by grace. The promises that are given in Christ, in whom all the promises are yea and amen. But surely they have no interest in the promises of the covenant of grace that are not the children of the covenant and that don't believe in any of the promises of the covenant and have no interest in the mediator of the covenant. There's only one person that stands between you and hell and that's Jesus Christ. He's it. He's the, he's the one person that can rescue me from hell, rescue you from hell. And as we close here, let me leave you with a quote. He says, you can't, well, this is something that I quoted. I stand responsible for this quote. You can't reject Christ and escape hell at the same time. It's impossible. Unfortunately, we have religious leaders today telling us that atheists are going to make it. doesn't matter what you believe. People from all religions are going to get in. Well, in a sense, that's true because it's people that receive Christ. People from all religions have received Christ. However, the Bible is very strong and very clear. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. That's it. So as we close here, again, I, I don't use manipulation, but as we close in prayer, I want to encourage you that uh, we're going to do part two of this tonight and look a little more at this subject matter. But if you are disturbed for your soul and you really do want to receive Christ, um, you can talk to any number of people here. You, you can talk to me. You can talk to Gordon. You can talk to Butch. You can talk to your parents. Talk to anyone in this place or your wife. And, um, you know, ultimately it's not us that saves. It's God who saves. And we just want to encourage you
that if you don't feel like you are saved, then to talk to someone. Talk to someone who you know is going to give you Bible, give you truth, and receive him today. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you once again for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your message. And uh, Lord, we pray today that your word would not return void, but accomplish that for which you've sent it to do. Lord, this morning, as you know, we do not manipulate, but we pray that the Holy Spirit would open people's hearts in this place and that hearts would be regenerated by the power of your spirit. That as we take this subject matter home with us and we think about it, may you begin to work on our hearts. And Lord, we pray that if there be anyone in this place who does not know you, it's our desire as a church, Father, that um, no one in this place would go to hell, but that everyone under the sound of my voice would make it to glory. You know, Lord, as a church, that's our desire. We, we don't want anyone in this place to miss, miss the best life later. Um, Lord, touch hearts in this place today, we pray, and, and may you, in spite of the foolishness of how we preach, may you impress upon the hearts of the hearers the reality of what we've been discussing today. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Love you.